So first of all, I want to really thank all of you, and particularly Julia, James, Jörg, who can't be here, Peter, for standing in, and uh, all the participants. Uh, this wonderful surprise session. When I uh, when I received the email from Julia last week, it literally took me three readings to figure out what was going on. I had no idea. <laughs> I, I I usually get you know uh, from the Goldsmith. Institute Center that she co-founds and co-directs, I get these uh, announcements, but I, this one I couldn't quite figure out how it worked until, until particularly since it mentioned Arlette and the, this and your date and uh, I finally figured it out, uh, I guess, and I was very, I must say, moved and, 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 and touched as much as anybody can be moved and touched uh, in this period when we've all become untouchables basically and uh, and very little uh, movement uh, as well at least in my case so uh, uh julia julia mentioned you said you don't have to uh, prepare anything formal for your reply <laughs> uh however uh, i'm glad that i did prepare something uh, because uh, for two reasons first of all it would be really impossible for me to to even begin to respond to all the presentations that we've heard individually, singularly. But it turns out, uh, it turns out that uh, what I do want to uh, present actually does respond to a good many, both more or less directly or, or indirectly to Hector, to James, to Javier, even uh, to Marion and so on. Um, so uh, what it is, is it's a, um, I was, I was then uh, stimulated by the uh, event to go back to the a book I've been writing uh, coming out of my teaching of the last two uh, quarters, which is on as, as uh, related to the article that Hector mentioned, it's called uh, Recounting the Plague, Pre-existing Conditions, Recounting the Plague. And uh, I've sort of put together uh, what, I, what may turn out to be a book with that title. And what I've done is to go to the, uh, 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 six months ago, I presented uh, mainly in a German department uh, event. I presented that essay that Hector referred to, uh, just trying to tell how this whole project um, arose. Uh, uh, actually independently and, and antedating COVID by, by several months. So just a huge co uh, coincidence that, it, that it, it came at that time. And, uh, uh, um, um, but it seemed to me that it was a wonderful topic, a fascinating topic for all sorts of reasons to, to, to research, to teach involving literature, but not only literature. Some have mentioned how my concern is always, uh, I think it was Isabel, uh, to try to relate literature to, to things beyond uh, it, it, beyond it in the narrow sense. And uh, so anyway, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I've rewritten the concluding chapter and above all, I've tried to condense it so that it isn't too long and should be able to get through it in about 20 minutes, I hope. Uh, and I wanna present that to you. And as I say, I'm sort of uh, comforted, although I, I feel very uh, uh, reluctant to impose yet another presentation after all of these uh, excellent presentations. And above all, that we've been now uh, at this now for about four hours, but I'm going to nevertheless do it uh, because precisely it, for me at least, addresses so many of the points that were uh, raised uh, in the course of these presentations. So here goes. <clears throat> uh, early in uh, Camus' novel, The Plague, the main character and narrator, Dr. Bernard Rieu, describes the state of unpreparedness in which his fellow citizens of Oran found themselves at the outbreak of the plague. And now a quote, rather long, Ryu writes, our townsfolk were like everyone else, wrapped up in themselves. In other words, they were humanists. That is, they did not believe in calamities in French fléau. A calamity is not made to the measure of man. One tells oneself that the calamity is unreal that it's a bad dream, that it will pass, but it refuses to pass. 
and from bad dream to bad dream, what passes are humans. And first of all, humanists, because they've not taken any precautions. Our fellow citizens were not more guilty than others. They forgot to be modest, that's all. And they thought that everything was still possible for them, end quote. Now, this is just one of the many rather sententious passages that fill this novel. But despite its moralizing tone, it remains memorable, for me at least, perhaps because of the unusual connection it makes between what Ryu calls humanists and calamities. Extreme disasters, he suggests, are not easy to measure in terms usually associated with human life. For if man is the measure of all things, one of the humanist credos, such calamities fall outside what is imaginable. For Ryu, there's nothing unusual about this. We all judge things by relating them to what is familiar. Quote, our fellow citizens were not more guilty than others. They simply forgot to be modest. Such lack of modesty, however, leaves those it afflicts particularly unprepared to deal with what exceeds the normal and familiar. We have seen this recently, more recently at work in many of the responses to the initial outbreak of COVID-19, where many of those in a position of official responsibility, whether national or international, tended to explain the, the general lack of preparedness by insisting, quote, that no one could have predicted the worldwide spread of COVID-19. Whereas in fact, such pandemics had in recent years been predicted with increasing insistency and not just by epidemiologists. The list of such predictions is far too long to list here. One book published in 2015 in France was entitled, I translate, The Return of Epidemics. And in the past few decades, there have been many such books, articles, movies, video series, stimulated in part by the emergence of AIDS, Ebola, SARS, MERS, Zika, Dengue, and many other highly contagious diseases. But the allocation of resources to improve national and international public health facilities in order to study and prepare for future pandemics was rarely a high priority for individual nations, except in certain areas that had previously been hard hit by these, one of these epidemics. One such exception is Taiwan. I'll be interested to see what Hector has to say about this. Following the outbreak of SARS in China in 2002, Taiwan suffered the highest per capita mortality rate in the world from this disease. But as a result, the Taiwanese government took certain measures. They created a central epidemic command center to coordinate both governmental and civil responses, first to SARS and then 17 years later to COVID-19. Its success in dealing with the pandemic has been, I believe, unique. Uh, as of November 27th, the country, which borders, of course, on China, with a population of 23 and a half million, has suffered only seven fatalities due to the disease. Of course, Taiwan is an island and can thus control its borders perhaps more easily than most other countries. But in response to the outbreak of COVID-19 in Wuhan in December of it, but its response to this outbreak in December of 2019 was effective in part because it was coordinated and in part because it enjoyed wide popular support. Mindful of Dr. Ryu's remark about the lack of modesty of his fellow citizens in the fictionalized Iran of the 1940s, the following remark in a recent paper reflecting upon lessons learned from Taiwan's COVID response is instructive. Quote, reflections upon past uncivil acts among citizens motivated the civil sphere to foster a discourse of interdependence 
redefining the boundaries between individual choices and civic virtues, end quote. Of course, as the authors acknowledge, a mere discourse is not enough if the social reality does not in some way support the value of interdependence, namely as a social and economic reality and not just as a proclaimed civic virtue. There is a remarkable literary articulation of how reflections upon past acts, uncivil or not, can force to foster but also impede such the development of such a discourse of interdependence through which the boundaries between individual choices and civic virtues can be redrawn. I am thinking here of one of the earliest literary articulations of a plague and its devastating consequences, namely Sophocles' tragedy, King Oedipus. As you may remember, the play begins with a group of Thebans gathering before the royal palace to beg Oedipus, who has saved the city once before from the Sphinx, to do it again, this time from the plague that is ravaging Thebes. Oedipus has sent his brother-in-law Creon to get advice from the Delphic Oracle. Creon returns with a message from the Oracle, and Oedipus orders him to read it aloud before the assembled Thebans. This is how the words of the oracle are rendered into English by E.P. Watling in a translation I have modified slightly using another version of the eminent classicist Richard Jebb. I quote, Creon, there is an, unthing, an unclean thing, miasma, born and nursed on our soil, polluting our soil, which must be driven away, not cherished what is past Pure. Oedipus responds, what unclean thing and what purification is required? Creon, the banishment of a man or the payment of blood for blood, for the shedding of blood is the cause of our city's peril. Oedipus, what blood does he mean? Did he say who it was that died? Creon, we had a king, sir, before you came to lead us. His name was Laius. This rendition of the oracle's words is roughly similar to that of almost all translations of the play that I know of, however, with one significant exception, to which I'll come in a moment. In this version, the traditional one, the message conveyed by the oracle is that the plague is an unclean thing, which, however, is only one of the meanings of the Greek word miasma that has been born and nursed on our soil, and that it therefore must be cleansed and purged. When Oedipus follows up by asking what purification is required, Creon goes on to give details and interpret the oracle even more specifically, designating the miasma to be a punishment for a murder that must be avenged blood for blood. And finally, to complete this interpretation, Creon informs Oedipus of the unavenged murder of the former king, Laius. This, of course, sets the play on its tragic course, as Oedipus, who has saved Thebes once, seeks to save it again, this time from the plague, by discovering and punishing the murderer, presumably through execution or banishment. In this sense, harking back to Camus' Rieux, Oedipus can be said to respond as the perfect humanist, that in a certain sense, in the myth he's already shown himself to be, namely by solving the riddle of the Sphinx, what goes on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon, and three legs in the evening, with the generic and generalizing response, man. This is, of course, in the myth and not in the play. In the drama, such a general answer will not be enough. Oedipus will have to find the particular individual who committed the murder of Laius. So much for the traditional translation, and it's the explication of how the words of the oracle lead Oedipus along the path of his undoing. However, as I've said, there is at least one translator of this play who insisted that this interpretation of the oracle by Oedipus 
which sets the whole tragedy in motion, was not the only possible one available to him. This was asserted by Friedrich Hölderlin, who translated both Sophocles' King Oedipus and his Antigone shortly before suffering a mental breakdown that was, condemn, condemn, that was to condemn him first to an asylum and then to semi-internment for the rest of his life. Hölderlin accompanied his translations of the two Sophoclean tragedies with remarks, the extraordinary density of which has provoked a great number of commentaries. The passage I wish to focus on today, which begins the second section of his remarks on Oedipus, has, to my knowledge, been largely neglected by critics, perhaps because it does not so much discuss the tragedy in its consecrated form, but as it does one that does not exist and probably never could. And yet, Hurley never, nevertheless insists that his remark seeks to articulate nothing less than the key to the work as a whole. It concerns the way Oedipus responds to the words of the oracle. This is how he introduces his remark, his interpretation, quote, the intelligibility of the whole requires one above all to focus on the scene where the oracle's message is interpreted to infinitely, put in italics or spaced out, by Oedipus, who is tempted by nephas. Hurlin's use here of the Latin word nephas is particularly striking, given that he's writing about a Greek tragedy. The word literally means that which is not said or should not be said. To write that Oedipus is tempted by nephas suggests that he yields to the wish to have language say the unsayable, and to this end interprets the oracle's words too infinitely. And yet, when we read carefully Hölderlin's translation of the oracle's message and his gloss of the text, we see that too infinitely here also means too particularly. Here is the passage, first in an English translation, which tries its best to follow the syntax of Hölderlin's German, rendering Creon's account of the message he brings from the oracle. And then I'll give it in German. So in English, clearly commanded are we from Phoebus the king, the country's stain, schmach, on this ground nourished, to be is to be tracked, verfolgt, not the incurable nurtured. And in German, geboten hat uns Phoebus klar der König, man soll des Landes schmach auf diesem Grund genährt verfolgen. Nicht unheilbares ernähren. Now, there are two main divergences of this Hildelinian rendering of the oracle from the traditional Wackling Jeb translation. First, Hildelin translates miasma, which Wackling Jeb render as unclean thing, as schmach, which I translate as stain, but which can also mean disgrace. Second, since traditional translations render the oracle as describing the miasma as an unclean thing polluting, polluting our soil, the logical response, as already mentioned, is to try to purge or cleanse it through extirpation. In Hölderlin's translation, by contrast, the oracle commands not to expel the miasma, but to verfolgen, which is to say to track or trace it. Verfolgen can also mean pursue. But this is still quite different from expelling it, that is, from removing it from the place where it was born or emerged. This distinction between expelling and pursuing allows Herdelin to introduce the most startling part of his interpretation, not just of the passage, but of the whole tragedy. Note, however, that this surprising gloss is formulated through use of the conditional tense, which gives his interpretation an almost conjectural quality. Hölderlin writes, first in English and in German, this could mean judge generally a strict and pure 
Tribunal Gericht. Keep good civic order. Haltet gute bürgerliche Ordnung. Oedipus, however, responds immediately by speaking in a priestly manner. Through what cleansing, etc. So in German, I know many of you know German here. Das könnte heißen, richtet allgemein ein streng und rein Gericht, haltet gute bürgerliche Ordnung. Oedipus aber spricht gleich darauf priesterlich, durch welche Reinigung, etc. Priestly here is linked to the notion of purgation, of cleansing. To cleanse is to suppose that what needs cleansing is or was originally pure. This assumption of an original purity, which is presumed but not stated as such, is perhaps what links the infinite to the finite, the universal to the particular in Oedipus's priestly discourse. As Hertelin makes clear when he continues his description of Oedipus's fatal mistake. Having assumed the general necessity of purification, Oedipus then directly, and I quote, he moves to particulars, quote, and to what man does he signify this destiny? And it is this, Hurdelin continues, that brings Creon's thoughts to the terrible words, we had, O king, Laius, formerly as lord in this land before you ruled the city, end quote. To sum up this gloss, Hölderlin interprets Oedipus as yielding to the temptation of the nephas, first by universalizing the miasma as something that can be purged or cleansed, and then identifying its cause to be the act of a particular individual. Hölderlin elaborates this as follows. In the following scene, the spirit of Oedipus, all-knowing, speaks out the nephas when it suspiciously interprets the oracle's general command particularly. This will relate to some of the things that James Martel was saying about command law. In German, in dem er das Al Oedipus, das allgemeine Gebot, argwöhnisch insbesondere deutet. By applying it, he continues to the murderer of Laios, and thus taking the sin to be infinite. Unfortunately, there's no time here and today to go into the details of this extremely singular and thought-provoking reading. I will simply suggest that Hörderlin's interpretation can serve to remind us that beyond the specific tragedy in question, language, whether oracular or not, inescapably speaks in generalities and that therefore when it tries to de designate particulars, whether an individual murderer or something else, it requires a certain kind of judgment, which some have called a decision. And by the way, I note that James, when he was talking about the interpreting the, the gebot and law differently, uh, then he used the word decision repeatedly, which some have called a decision in order to make the leap from the general to the particular. Hörderlin here goes one step further in associating that judgment or decision with a certain kind of tribunal, which is the way I am translating Gericht, a word that suggests not simply a self-contained logical judgment, in German a, an Urteil, since it also implies an institution with all the contingencies that this entails. The alternative that Herzlin thus proposes through this reading of Oedipus is one that calls for institutions as something other than simply the embodiment of general principles or the product of particular individuals. Instead of judging priesterly and too infinitely, the verdicts of such a tribunal could be called strict and pure to the extent that they would not claim to arrive directly at particulars from general concepts or laws. Above all, they would not proceed under the assumption later formulated by Nietzsche in the memorable phrase that where there is a deed, there must be a doer. 
wo ein Tat ist, muss ein Täter sein. Especially where calamities are concerned. Such a monocausal logic could be replaced by the decision not so much to determine guilt or innocence as to track down the structural, social, pre-existing conditions that calamities require in order to unleash their destructive force. Perhaps this is what Hurdlin might have had in mind when he envisaged a response to the oracle that would seek not to identify a murderer, but to restore and maintain what he called good civic order, gute bürgerliche Ordnung, perhaps. Of course, had Sophocles allowed Oedipus to respond as envisaged by Hurdlin, we would never have had the tragedy as we know it, nor probably any tragedy at all. Perhaps we would have had something more like a Greek Trauerspiel, if such is conceivable, which according to Walter Benjamin, it is not. But Hölderlin was not Sophocles. Germany around 1800 was not Athens around 420 BC. And we here today are neither. But Hölderlin's attempt to warn of the danger of responding to catastrophes by confounding the finite with the infinite, the individual with the general, the human with the divine, anticipates the lesson that some Taiwanese at least seem to have learned from their experience with the plague, namely the need, I quote again, to, <clears throat> to foster a discourse of interdependence and of redefining the boundaries between individual choice and civic virtues. In short, perhaps plagues and calamities can help us to develop practices of solidarity and not simply of solitude. Practices which in so doing would not forget to be modest. That's it. Thanks. Voila. Okay. I can Wonderful. See, see everybody now here. Super bizarre on Zoom when you can't hear anything, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, and I'm sorry again, my apologies for inflicting yet another presentation at the end of this, this long and, and wonderful session. But I think you see how it really uh, tries to, without knowing what people are going to say, of course, how in some ways it tries to respond to at least some of the issues that were, that were uh, uh, raised here. And I'll just add to that, that it's, since it's not obvious here, that the whole idea of uh, recounting the plague picks up uh, on some of the points that Marion was mentioning about statistics and uh, the use of statistics in, uh, in, 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 in articulating and responding to plagues. And uh, uh, in, in the book that I'm hoping to finish, um, my main example of that is Defoe who, and, and there have been articles written on that, actually recent articles uh, about how Defoe, uh, who uh, is very statistically, very scrupulous in giving statistics at the same time, insists on recounting things that, that don't can't be uh, statistically F, uh, uh, seized because precisely they involve singular situations of singular mortal living beings. And so that's his, his, his journal is very much, uh, uh, is very all the more powerful, I think, because of because of that. Voila, say too. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> well, we've, we've come to the end of our time. I don't know if people want to hang around a little bit longer or something. But uh, I just wanted to tell everyone that we're going to try to write these all up. Um, and to maybe try to get this published somewhere and, and uh, uh, so maybe we can uh, we can include some of the st stuff that you were just talking about, Sam, and that. Um, although I know that's going to be a separate publication too. Um, but uh, I don't know, Julia. Do you have any any uh, parting thoughts for us as we finish this? Um, no, just you know. Again, thank you everybody for um, uh, being here. Um, and um, if I 
if I had had the foresight, I would, you know, just propose that we all give Sam a toast at this moment <laughs> in spite of the weird time zone differences that we're all facing. I mean, it's the right time for me, but no, <laughs> and Mary and, <laughs> and Sam, and maybe not for some of you in the United States. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Thank you again. And um, I don't know if people want to just hang out for a little bit, but um, yeah, happy Fine. birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks to, thank you for all. And thank you to everyone who, who came and so on. Happy, Happy birthday, Sam. Sam. Happy birthday, Sam. Oh, there we Happy go. Birthday. Okay. Lots of Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. All I can say. All I can say. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. The, only thing, the, only thing, the only thing worse than reaching the age of 80 is probably not reaching it. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you for this great, great celebration and so on. Brilliant day. It's been a brilliant day. Thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you me. all for, for, for being here. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. That's all, folks. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> I guess we'll, we'll, send, we'll send a copy of the recording to everyone. And again, look oh, out great. for the, the written the written version some someday. <laughs> okay. Stay well. Bye bye, Sam. Thanks, yeah. Sam. Bye bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you so bye. much. Bye. Happy birthday. Thank you.